All right, so in this video, we're going to be looking at the nucleophilic addition to carbonyls. This is part two uh, of the, the lectures. And uh, in the first video, we looked at two uh, types of nucleophiles that had that were high energy sigma bonds. The first was a Grignard reagent, um, which you've seen before. There's a high energy uh, sigma bond between the carbon and the magnesium. Might have also been a lithium. Um, so organometallics are really good. And we'll expand more on that later in the course. We also looked at sodium borohydride, which has this high energy sigma bond which can add to carbonyls. In this lecture, we're going to be focusing on the nitrile and water. And both these nucleophiles, from a synthetic point of view, are actually not very interesting um, in organic chemistry, certainly in terms of their addition to, to carbonyls. Um, but they're actually, the reason we're looking at it is because they actually uh, demonstrate some important principles uh, in terms of reactions to carbonyls. And that's why we're going to be looking um, at them. So we're going to start off with the nitrile, and I've drawn up the scheme of this reaction over here. We can take an aldehyde, and if we treat it with sodium cyanide in a bit of acid, and this is one of the key things that we're going to start to see uh, and, and themes that emerge, uh, we get this um, uh, addition product over here. And this one is actually referred to as a cyanohydrin. Uh, so cyanohydrins are well known, and um, if the nitrile is hydrolyzed to carboxylic acid, it could be uh, it could be uh, useful. But it's a rather specific reaction. Uh, the important thing here is that actually this reaction is in equilibrium, and we can drive the reaction back to uh, the the aldehyde fairly fairly easily. Um, let's just look at the the mechanism of this because it actually introduces some of the important concepts uh, on uh, aldehydes. Uh, on, uh, for these uh, reactions. So the first step is actually to do with the, 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 the acid catalyst. And that is that the aldehyde itself needs to be the carbonyl picks up a proton. So here we see the lone pair of electrons on the oxygen acting as a nucleophile and adding to a proton. The important thing of this, and notice this again, this is an equilibrium, is that this step, and it's a step that you're going to see over and over again uh, in organic chemistry, this protonation of a carbonyl, this step over here superactivates the electrophilic position of the carbon. Because now that you put the proton on, you've got this positive charge on the oxygen, it's already electronegative, drawing electrons away. It's now drawing the electrons away even more. And so in this case, when we now have a rather weak nucleophile, like the nitrile anion, um, that can now add, whereas it couldn't do it before, or not easily, uh, it can add very readily onto the, the carbonyl carbon. So this activation mode of adding an acid of, uh, to, to activate a carbonyl, as I've said, is something which you're going to see over and over again. So mechanistically, this has actually been incredibly simple. I mean, we've got to this in essentially it's two steps, protonation and then uh, addition of the nitrile, and we have our cyanohydrin like that. What we also should be able to do is draw out the molecular orbital diagram of this uh, of this reaction. So I'm just going to do it now quickly over here. And this is something, it's, there's no difference per se from everything that we've done uh, and seen before. So let's have a look at this. Okay, so um, <clears throat> here we have the molecular orbital diagram that we've uh, that I've drawn out. I've done the shading, so this is the pi star antibonding orbital that the nucleophile is adding to on this carbon over there, uh, and the pi star is the LUMO, the HOMO is the lone pair of electrons that's on the carbon, which is in an N orbital, or we can also talk about it being an SP um, hybridized orbital, that's fine, and notice that we have this angle of attack, this 107, uh, 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 5 degree Bergy Dunnett's angle of attack which we are showing. So the orbitals are lining up quite neatly. So there's nothing uh, new and fascinating about that. All right, so let's just have a look at the next nucleophile, which is, is water. So this uh, equation that I've drawn up over there is what is sometimes known as the hydration of a carbonyl compound. Um, so uh, this uh, functional group that's been formed over there is known as geminal diol, geminal diol. Uh, and the reality is that geminal diols you hardly ever, ever see in organic chemistry, mainly because the equilibrium for this type of reaction actually lies a little bit more towards the left-hand side. Um, and so actually in this particular example over here is one of the unique cases where it's actually about 50-50. 
Um, but this reaction is really good at uh, teaching us um, one about mechanisms, uh, and we're going to see the same pattern again, so we're going to do that. But it's also going to teach us something about um, the, the differences between different carbonyl groups that accept nucleophiles and the rates of reactions uh, that are influenced by that. So let's just do the mechanism first, and then we'll look at the, uh, the, the features of carbonyl uh, compounds that actually are important to, to know in organic chemistry. So the first step is, again, the same principle that we're going to see over and over again. It is the protonation of the lone pair of electrons, because they're the most nucleophilic. We've got a strong acid present, so we are going to protonate that, and we activate the carbonyl. And so now once that is activated, the weak nucleophile, which is water, OH2, uh, can now add to the carbon over there and break the pi bond like that. Uh, and once that happens, we end up with something that looks like this. It's an OH. And of course, this is now an OH2. There's a second hydrogen because it was still part of it over there. And the last step is that that H needs to leave. So it's going to give its electrons back to oxygen. It leaves as H+. So overall, this reaction is catalyzed by the, um, the acid that we have, have there because we added it in the beginning and we lost it at the end over there. Okay, so one of the things you can also do over here is you can draw out the molecular orbital diagram. It's exactly the same as what we've done before. The only difference is in now having water as the nucleophile and one of the lone pair of electrons. So I'm not going to... Uh, draw that out. You should be able to do that uh, yourselves and you'll get some practice on that. Um, but what we are going to do now is I want to just look at the features in terms of what affects the equilibria in these reactions. Um, and there's some important ones to actually look at and all of them make a lot of sense. So let's look at this. The effects that we're looking at are sterics, electrostatics, so this is charges, uh, and then stereoelectronics, which is our homo lumo effects, stereoelectronics. Okay, so the first one I want to look at is sterics, and this might not be particularly uh, obvious to you, but if you take um, a, an aldehyde like that and treat it with water uh, in some a acid uh, to form the geminal diol, the equilibrium constant of this one over there is approximately one. You don't need to know this, I'm just, but a value of one basically means there's a 50-50 of those. However, if we do the same thing, but we take a ketone and we add water and um, acid, the geminal diol that would form would look like this. And the equilibrium constant of this is about a thousand times less than, than the aldehyde. Now, the reason for this is sterics, and it may not be so obvious to you, but let's just look at this very carefully. So, on this aldehyde, we have a hydrogen. The angle between this bond here to the carbon and the hydrogen over there, because this is trigonal planar, is 120 degrees. All right, so there's a nice um, open sort of space between them. Once the reaction happens, the angle, as this becomes tetrahedral, the angle reduces to 109 degrees. Okay, and this happens in both cases over here. Again, we've got this 120 degree angle over there, and here we now have a 109 degree. The difference is, is that in this one over here, the hydrogen is relatively small. So as it changes to tetrahedral, the bonds are going to be moving closer to each other, just slightly. But that difference is a problem over here where we have two carbon atoms which are now moving closer to each other. And in moving closer to each other, they're starting to bump into each other a little bit more. So because this is a very weak reaction and readily reversible, thermodynamically, the ketone is the preferred, uh, is the preferred side of the reaction or the preferred product. And so this equilibrium prefers going to the left. And the reason for that is a steric argument. Okay, It has to do with the bond angles. This is 120 degrees. It's a little bit bigger than the 109. In this case over here, we've got a carbon and a hydrogen. So there's a hydrogen obviously over there somewhere. And the angle between those is 109 degrees in the tetrahedral form. Obviously, I can't draw that um, in three dimensions. So because there it's a carbon and a hydrogen, 
versus a carbon and a carbon, this one over here is more sterically constrained, so it actually prefers to be on that side over there. So that is a steric argument. So we're going to go back to the hydration of an aldehyde, but what we're going to do now is we're going to change the aldehyde slightly, and I'm going to stick on, um, for argument's sake, two fluorine uh, uh, atoms over there, which are much more electronegative than the hydrogen atoms. Why not? Let's put on three. Um, and in doing so, um, the, the equilibrium on this, it actually shifts the equilibrium on this reaction. Sorry. OH, OH, and the three fluorines. It shifts the equilibrium of this reaction much more. In, it's, it's, it's extremely significant for all intents and purposes. Um, if we treat this molecule over here with water and a bit of catalytic acid, this is the only product that we see. We do not see a, a mixture of these two at all. And so the explanation for this uh, is electrostatics. And it has to do with the electron withdrawing effect of these fluorine groups because they're very electronegative. So because they're very electronegative, what they're doing is they're pulling electron density away from this carbon atom over there. It's making it that much more positive that the nucleophile wants to stick there and stay on there compared to this one over there. So it's a very different effect. Um, it's not to do with uh, sterics. It's overcoming the steric uh, effect because of this electron withdrawing effect that we see over there. And that effect is known as electrostatics. It's incredibly powerful, and we see it happening in a number of different um, uh, ways in organic chemistry. And that's why we're introducing it to you in this way over here. Last factor that we're looking at is stereoelectronics. And this one just speaks about the difference between, for instance, looking at a ketone like butanone versus an ester, or it could have been an amide, um, such as this one over here. And the difference between these two in terms of their ability to add a nucleophile to add to them is different. This a ketone is more reactive than an ester, and the reason has to do with stereoelectronics. You can look at this over here, and one of the arguments might be that the oxygen is more electronegative, and so it's pulling electron density away from this carbon and making it more positive. That argument would actually mean that the ester is more electrophilic and more reactive than a ketone. But in practice, this is not true. Esters are actually not as reactive as ketones. Ketones are more reactive. And aldehydes are even more reactive than ketones because they're less sterically hindered. So this one over here must have an argument as to why it is less reactive than a ketone. And the answer is stereoelectronics. So yes, although oxygen does pull electron density away from carbon, making it slightly positive, that effect is nullified by the lone pair of electrons on this oxygen that are able to donate in through resonance onto this pi bond. The effect is that the LUMO, which is what we want to react, when a nucleophile adds, it adds to the LUMO, it raises the energy of the LUMO. And therefore, it is not as good an electrophile. And so to get a nucleophile to add to an ester compared to um, a ketone, we need more energy. So for instance, a nitrile, uh, reacting on an ester, CN minus, uh, it'll add fine onto a ketone, but onto an ester, it's just not going to happen as well uh, at all. All right, so those are the three aspects that we need to, to uh, need to know. We've looked at two nucleophiles, water and nitrile. Um, we've seen that they are not great nucleophiles. We can draw them out in terms of their molecular orbitals. We can draw out the mechanisms. The key point of that mechanism is the protonation step to activate the carbonyl at the first, in, in the first step. And then we realize um, that actually these processes teach us something about the reactivity of carbonyl compounds, and that's really important. Aldehydes are much more reactive than ketones because of sterics. Ketones are more reactive than esters, and you'll see amines later as well, uh, because of stereoelectronics, where the LUMO is raising energy because of this donation of the lone pair of electrons into the pi star uh, orbital over, over there. 
Um, we can see it just in terms of resonance, and that's also uh, an acceptable argument. And lastly, we can see that a carbonyl group can be activated if we put some sort of electron withdrawing group on it. Even just one fluorine over here would activate this carbonyl a little bit more. All right, that's all we need to know.